All right, everybody, we're here with Wagner Rocha, and uh, we're going to interview him here. So the first question, Wagner, how old are you? 33. 33 years old. And when did you start jiu-jitsu? I started jiu-jitsu around 17 years old. So what year was that? Um, <laughs> Some math here. 17, see, let's say 17 years almost, because I'm going to be 34 soon. Wow. So we're talking... About 99, 2000? Yeah, 2000, yeah, close to 2000. And what year did you get your black belt? I got my black belt in 2000, at the end of 2007, at, literally in December of 2007. Awesome. So who did you begin training with when you started? I started my training um, at the um, BJJ Center over with uh, George Popovich, who is a uh, father of Pablo Popovich. Um, they had a little gym in Fort Lauderdale. And uh, I started my training there, you know, that's where I uh, did my first class. Wow. And what were your goals starting? Did you want to just do jiu-jitsu or was, was it MMA or what was in your, in your head? Um, How did you get started? Well, I got started because I went to, to Brazil and my cousin was training jiu-jitsu and uh, I kind of got a, a feel for it. And then uh, he put me on uh, to watch uh, some UFC stuff and uh, I changed... Uh, I changed my mindset from uh, you know enjoying jiu-jitsu to kind of wanting to fight. Um, I always enjoyed fighting as a kid. I don't know why, but I did. And uh, when I started doing um, classes uh, at their school, MMA was really big. You know, pride. And I mean, I remember my first first five training sessions. I trained with people like Minotaro, Mike Nogueira, uh, Dean Thomas. You know, right before he fought BJ Penn, stuff like that. Where I was like, wow, this is you know these guys are all doing this and. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna I'm gonna chase that dream. And that's uh, I, I I started doing it for for the MMA purpose, and then as I got into it more, I kind of fell in love with jujitsu, and then I was indecisive whether you know I'd go one way or another. Um, and today I've I still haven't decided which way I'm going. <laughs> I've gone both ways on it. So. So you you didn't really have your first MMA fight until after you got your black belt. Yeah, I decided to pretty awesome. to have a, my first professional fight after I was seriously dedicated to to training, you know, where I was before I was doing it as a hobby and, you know, because I had a job and then um, then I decided, you know, I wanted to be uh, an instructor and, and teach at a gym and after I got my gym open and I started, you know, get settled in and, you know, I started making a little money to survive, I started to get fights, you know, and um, I went I went that route after, after becoming a black belt because it, it also seemed seemed easier as well too because you know, I had some good ex Jiu Jitsu experience already in competition and, and to merge into MMA at the time which didn't have any amateur MMA uh, was, was the best solution for me. Okay, so do you have a family, kids, wife? Married uh, for almost 10 years now. Uh, I have uh, two children, uh, a boy and a girl and uh, you know everybody does Jiu Jitsu in the house so you know, nice. Jiu Jitsu is a lifestyle. And you're Brazilian, but I don't hear an accent, so what's up with that? Are you from there? Mm -hmm. Did you live there? I was uh, born in Brazil. I moved to the States when I was five. Raised in South Florida uh, from five to, to now. And uh, so I um, I speak fluent Portuguese, fluent English, and um, wasn't uh, never affected by uh, the language uh, barrier, you know, because uh, I really didn't go to school in Brazil. But because my parents, you know, only spoke Portuguese, I was forced to speak Portuguese in the house. So from childhood, you know, not going to school outside of the United States. So I basically, you know, did from kindergarten to high school here, and and always had Portuguese in the house. Spent summers in Brazil. You know, as a child, you know, my parents had full-time jobs, so they'd send me to grandma's, and I'd spend the summers there. And so I got to speak uh, both languages pretty well, you know. And then jujitsu kind of came in my life and made it even easier. So you've been competing, did you compete always from white to black or for jiu-jitsu or did you start I did, there? I competed um, from white to, I mean my first tournament I was like a month and a half of training um, and uh, I had a Naga, it was probably one of the first Nagas ever in South Florida and, um, and I competed in it and I did well and then um, I just got hooked, competition was, was it for me, I think competition is it, if you want to be successful in jiu-jitsu, 
whatever it is, you know, whatever it is your goal, you have to have some sort of competition in your life. Because if you just train to train, then you eventually get bored. You know, eventually you, you fade away from it. That's true. So how do you structure your training if you have a big tournament coming up like Abu Dhabi Trials or Abu Dhabi? Like how much rolling versus how much conditioning versus like what's your regimen? I have never worked out. I don't really lift weights. It just doesn't. Um, I hate it. <laughs> and um, one of the legends in jiu-jitsu said that uh, lifting weights is a waste of time. You know, and I agree with him. Uh, I think uh, if you lift weights, uh, you could take you take time from training. You know, so I, every time I ever lifted weights, that uh, I come in the next day and I'm beat and I'm sore. And I do a little running. I do a little. Um, cardio training, you know, like nothing that involves lifting actually weight, but you know, like running, maybe pushing a prowler, stuff that is cardio related, but um, I do a lot more training, you know, I do, some days I'll do three a days, you know, two a days, um, what I do is I do mix up um, days for just wrestling and days for just guard or days for just top or days, I just break it down into sections and that usually helps me a lot and then certain days I go harder than other days, of course. Um, so it all depends, you know, some days I'm in the gym with just the students, some days I visit Cyborgs in Miami, which is about 30 minutes from me. We have uh, uh, craziness there, and uh, so it all depends on my day of the week and how far I am from the tournament and, you know, what I need to get done. Typically when you're, when you're rolling, how many minutes, like if you're going for a big tournament, how many minutes versus rest versus, and how long? Um, I usually I set the clock for whatever the tournament is, and I put short rest, you know, because I want to have, um, I'll have, let's say if the tournament is a five-minute tournament or a ten-minute tournament. If it's a five-minute tournament, I'm going to set it for five minutes with a minute and a half rest. You know, if it's a ten-minute tournament, I'm going to set it for the same time with the same rest, you know. So I don't give um, um, a big amount of rest because I think um, you want to you wanna roll when you're tired because the feeling that you're going to have in the tournament um, you're never going to be able to recreate in the gym because the, the anxiety, the you know, your, your the stress, the competition, everything that goes inside that room that you feel that day when you compete is never going to be able to be recreated in the gym. Uh, it's very hard to at least um, one because you're never going to fight anybody at the same level as the guys you're fighting. Two, um, if you take long rests, you know, you're cheating yourself and, and the people around you. The best way to get pushed is to have a good group of guys just to focus on you, you know, if you're going to compete. Um, and that usually, that usually does it. Nice. So, who are your main training partners? Um, I train, my main training partners are a mix of the guys in my school, uh, in my gym, and everybody over at Fight Sports in Miami with Cyborg. Just name some of those guys. Oh uh, man, there's, there's a whole list of guys there. Uh, starting with, you know, with Cyborg himself, uh, De Nino, Dennis Mitchell, uh, Marcel Honcavis, um, you have uh, Hunter uh, from Hawaii, um, you got Ricardo Hanzino, um, you got um, I mean, you got so many people, there's so many good black belts in that place that uh, it uh, it's hard to just keep naming, I can go all day, you know, Jason, there's a bunch of guys there and uh, there's a lot of visitors too, you know, that's one of the great things about that place. Down south in Miami, everybody comes down to visit because of the weather and and the, and the training. So we have a lot of rotating people that come through there to, uh, to train with us. What would you say is your most memorable or most gratifying, uh, I guess, match in jiu-jitsu or tournament? Um, tournament, I would say um, there's a couple, you know. One when I was earlier in my career, before I ever did anything, where it, it kind of made me stand out, where I felt like that was that was the, the tournament that made me realize that I can actually do this for forever. Um, I went to California for the Pan Ams, No Gi Pan Ams. It was the first one ever hosted. I was a brown belt at the time, and um, I went there. And the weather, <clears throat> um, I got caught off guard by the weather because I went there in the summertime here. In the summer in Florida, is always hot, so I figured California is kind of like Florida. And I got there and it was really cold. And the first two days there, I got really sick. And um, I had a bracket of eight fights. And um, the day of the tournament, when I got to the tournament, as I was walking in, I puked into the trash. And um, I'm a really slow starter. So I, um, 
I um, always tend to get a good long warm up and get stretched out and get going. And that day, you know, I was in the, in the stands and I fell asleep. And they had called my name like twice, almost three times, if I'm mistaken. They even um, even uh, said that they were going to disqualify me over the over the microphone if I didn't show up. And one of my students came up, one of my friend's students, he came up, he grabbed me. He's like, hey, man, they're calling you. You got to go. You got to go. So I literally woke up and fought my first fight. And I won all the fights, all on regular time with no submission. And... Um, and it was just hard. It was just one of those days where every match I fought and I was just in my head going, I don't know if I can make the next one. You know, I don't know if I'm going to do the next one. I don't know if I'm going to do the next one. By the time I finished and I won, I was just so, like, thrilled, you know, and so pleased because of the being sick and feeling, you know, under the weather and, and being out of your comfort zone and being somewhere else and, and be able to win, you know, um, you know, a tournament with so many guys and so many big big names and there's a lot of guys that, that I fought that day that are you know you know jiu-jitsu guys now that are famous and it um, it really just that, that that made my day you know that that was probably the biggest tournament for me and, and then of course I had a couple of ADCC trials wins one in Jersey and, and the last one here in South Florida which were, that one was awesome you know that was at home with all my students and friends and training partners all watching and uh, I was able to take out some really good guys inside my backyard so that was Pretty gratifying. Awesome. So everybody says that, that fighting is, you know, 90% mental. You've you've fun big tournaments like Abu Dhabi, Pan Ams. You've been in the UFC. What is your mental state like going in? What, what what would you tell someone who's trying to make it about the mental side of fighting and the mental side of competing? You know, you could train your butt off, but then when you go in, some people just don't perform like they do on the mats and uh, in training. So what would you tell them, and what are your strategies for just getting your mind right? before and during um, a tournament? When I'm training, I usually don't care what happens in, in my training. You know, usually I train, um, I train to, to learn, you know, I train to, to get better. I don't strategize when I train. I don't, you know, do things that are gonna kind of keep me in my, in my comfort zone. You know, I almost try to put myself out of my comfort zone and kind of let go, you know, and let things happen and, and flow. Um, and when I compete, I, tend to think that making me feel that way when I train, when I compete, it makes me kind of, I almost kind of close up a little bit and I kind of play safe, but at the same time I feel like I really don't care, you know, I go out there and I'm, I just want to win, you know, if I don't win, I want to perform at my best, and if I perform at my best and I don't win, I'm okay with that, um, and one of the strategies that I use is I just try to have fun, you know, I don't think of it as I have to win or I have to do this or I have to do that because if you add that pressure on top of what you're doing already, you're just gonna you're gonna you're gonna burn yourself out and you're gonna tend to fail. Um, so when I'm backstage for an MMA fight or I'm backstage for a jiu-jitsu competition, I'm tend to you know have fun and talk and laugh and kind of forget the moment. You know, forget that it's gonna happen and any minute could be. Hey, you're ready? Let's go. You know, um, I try to get away from that because then. I don't have to think about it, and I don't have to stress it. And when I go out there and fight, I'm just gonna do what I've been doing in in the room, anyways. I've been training hard for it, so you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna make it fun. You know, and I'm gonna enjoy winning or losing, uh, but performing at my best. You know. So let's talk about the Abu Dhabi trials, the one you just won, your match with uh, John Satava. That's a really popular one on the internet right now. A lot of people watch it. It's got a ton of views. He got position on you in the beginning, and then you kind of, the reason it was such a great match because you came back and then took his back. You got the body triangle, you're screaming, yeah, you know, like you're into it, and, and it was just a great match, really entertaining. So just talk a little bit about that and, and what you were thinking when he had good position and, and, and how you were able to just reverse it and, and how you knew you were going to win after you got the body triangle. Like, is that something that you you just know not many people escape your body triangle, or, or what is that? Um. Wow, that, that match was pretty cool. One, for two reasons. I, I kind of knew John from um, before I met him many, many years ago. At um, Well, first I think he, he used to train at Pablo's where I started. He came there a couple of times. I don't remember him from there, but we met each other in uh, Abu Dhabi Charles uh, many years after, or many years before, and we had a conversation. We talked about jiu-jitsu, and hey, he's a cool guy. And then... Um, when I got to the EDCC trials, I looked at the bracket and I saw his name, and I knew he, we were gonna we were gonna fight. Just because of where we were placed, I knew we were gonna eventually have to fight each other because I'd been watching him, 
and he was, uh, you know, he's already come up in the game and he's becoming a tough competitor. I even walked by him and said, hey man, good luck, you know, I know we're probably going to face each other. Um, and, um, and he was cool and um, I, I started the match so wrong. I, um, I had watched a match on him, I like to study people, I'd watch a match on him where he got foot locked and I, I, I do pretty well with feet and um, I decided to pull guard and go underneath him to to uh, attack his feet and uh, it ultimately just blew up on me because when I pulled he locked me down and I couldn't move I got stuck and then he proceeded to mount and uh, I did, couldn't stop him so he mounted and I was just in my head going alright I've been here before I've been mounted by tons of guys like him you know um, you know training with Cyborg and you know some of the guys I've trained with in the past it, it's not an unfamiliar position so and I, and I like the ADCC rules because there's no points in the beginning, so I wasn't worried because I knew I wasn't scored on. Um, so I knew in my head two things. I need to switch the position over. One, because I knew Jonathan came from a wrestling background, and I was almost so, almost sure he didn't want to be on his back. So I, uh, I turned to try to oompa him over, and he followed me to my back. He set his hooks. So then I started defending the hooks, and I started to shake. And when I started to shake, I felt him loosen up. And um, that's when I knew in my head, I was like, oh man, I'm going to get him off my back now and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flip the script on him, you know? So when I was able to shake him off, I felt the, his energy the whole time was trying to just get up. And because I've trained so much for guys in MMA trying to get up when I'm on top, I, was, I knew it was just a matter of time that he wasn't going to sweep me or he wasn't going to get me with the you know, submissions that he was planning. That was just a matter of time for me to set up my, uh, you know, my patented moves, you know, my 50-50 of the arms. Um, my Kimura series that I do, I, I just knew he was going to fall into it and um, just because of the way he was setting up his X-guard sweeps and I've used uh, a lot of my movements for those sweeps, you know, for those deep half X-guard sweeps, you know, and he was, he's from a, a school where it's, it's, a, it's a, one, of the, one of their biggest tools, you know, the X-guard. So I knew I, I had the opportunity to fall there and then when I did get to his back, um, the body triangle is just one of those things that I've learned to kind of secure and not lose. So when I got to his back, I knew I wasn't going anywhere. I knew I could easily put my hands up in the air and celebrate because I wasn't going to move. I was just going to be stuck there. Um, and I, you know, I felt bad celebrating in his ear. I told him all sorry afterwards, but you know, I was excited. You know, you start a match where you're mounted and your back is taken and you're passed and all these things happen, and then you were able to flip the script. You have to be, a, you have to celebrate a little bit. You have to be a little happy, you know. So, it, uh, like I said, when I knew when I got to the back, it was, it was game over, you know. Nice. So, two questions: your toughest, the toughest guy you've ever went against, or the most skilled guy you've ever trained with, and the most skilled guy you've ever grappled against. Hmm. If you had skilled to guess, guy, yeah. Most skilled guy. Oh, I think it's the same person. Yeah, nice. I think it's the same guy. He's, uh, he's probably one of the toughest guys I've ever trained with and probably one of the toughest matches I've ever had. Uh, Rodolfo Vieira. Um, yeah, C Cyborg is definitely right there. Cyborg is Cyborg is so unique. He's the, he's like the nicest guy in the world. He'd probably be the toughest guy I've ever trained with because he just... He, he's unique, you know, like every day is different with him. Some days you, you think you're having a great day with him and then some days you're just his play toy, you know. So... Um, but definitely, you know, for a person that, you know, I got short time to work with, I think Rodolfo was definitely unique because um, I thought he would be stronger in training, you know, like more explosive and pushy, but he was very, 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 very intelligent, you know. He learns your game, and then once he learns your game, it seems to be just shut down, you know. And I also competed against him, and that was a hard match as well. So, and um, we fought in Abu Dhabi uh, in 2000. 11, yeah, and it was a 0-0 zero, zero match, and uh, the ref oh, it was a 2-2 two, two match, and the referees gave it to him, which to me, to this day, was, I thought I won, but very hard match, because he, he uh, when I was up on the scoreboard, he did everything in his willpower to come up, you know, to get back and score and to even up, so definitely, definitely, uh, I'd have to say him right now. Let's talk about one of your, your really big wins, uh, Omula Bahal, in uh absolute division of this past Abu Dhabi. You know, he was the favorite to win the whole thing in, in his weight class, and then he went into the absolute, and uh, you got in the absolute, and it was you two, and 
and you beat him, you know. Um, I'm sure a lot of people may have thought that he would beat you because, number one, he's bigger, and, and number two, he won Abu Dhabi. So they, just tell us what you were thinking going in there and then how that match went. Uh, Homlo is a legend um, in jiu-jitsu, period. He's, um, he's won worlds you know, multiple times. He's won Nogi worlds. He's won ADCC. He's won he was absolute uh, finalist, like, I think, three years in a row against two or three years in a row against Harger Gracie uh, in 2008, seven, I'm not mistaken, somewhere in that year. The guy is just an um, absolute monster. Um, and um, I knew all of that going into the fight. And um, I just was confident in, in my in my training. You know, like I said, uh, I was able to train with Cyborg and Rodolfo and, uh, you know, Pusheisha and, you know, Pavel Popovich and so many guys over the years that, you know, knowing how good this guy was and, you know how impressive his 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 uh, resume is. I I knew that if I just played right and I played smart, I could beat him. Um, I know he would not underestimate me as far as size wise and uh, ability wise. And I think once I scored and he started to see the the tunnel, the light at the end of the tunnel becoming smaller and smaller, and that he wasn't going to get it back, it um, it set on him. And he was even a little upset. And I, and we, I talked to him a little bit, and he's a great guy. But uh, that was a big win for me. Uh, I wish I had continued the win, you know, and got in on to the next round and won another one. But, again, happy with performing at my best and just being there and trying my hardest, you know. So I got I got a, a couple good wins, you know, guys like him over the years, you know. So he was uh, definitely one of the bigger ones um, for, for, my, for my career at least. Awesome. All right, so let's talk about what you got going on now. Um, you know, there's a DVD series you're coming out with, and just tell us a little bit about it, what's on it, and what it took to, to make this, and uh, and when it's coming out, and everything like that. Uh, I set up, um, I've been setting up to do this for many years. Um, I, uh, I I have this Kimura series, uh, I call 50-50 of the arms. That why, um, why do you call it that? Um, because it, you fall into a position where your arms are always locked in, and, and you know you're not going to be locked in on one person's arm, and they're not going to have their hands on it to defend. So it kind of looks like the 50/50 of the legs, of course, but it's the arms, and your bodies are reversed the other way. Um, it uh, it's a position that's always worked for me, and it's always done me well because um, in nogi, especially, I've always had trouble with wrestlers and good top guys and good heavy, bigger, stronger opponents. And this position, once I started to use it and I started to set it up in my favor, it just started to work like like a hot knife through butter. You know, I started to beat a lot of opponents and uh, and uh, and take advantage of a lot of opportunities with guys that I, you know, probably wouldn't have been able to before because of this position. Uh, you know, from deep half position to passing the guard to uh, defending takedowns to uh, you know sweeping from the bottom. To being trying to take somebody's back when they're in turtle and be able to set up submissions off the back, you know this position has um, revolutionized my game, and uh, and I've helped a lot of other guys along the way with them with the same position and, and changed their games, I believe. So awesome! So when does it come out? And uh, yeah, February twenty third. It's going to be launched. So keep an eye out for it. Fifty fifty of the arms. Uh, some more funnels. So it's uh it's just strategy after strategy with with Kimuras from everywhere from the guard to half guard bottom to half guard top to you know rolling passing to on the back to turtle anywhere you can imagine catching a Kimura I show it because it's it just works because once you get stuck um, once you get stuck on the arms it's just a matter of you funneling the person into a submission so it's, it's there's no other way to to do no gi jiu jitsu than this way. You know, a lot of guys, you know, go from the gi to no gi and they have a hard time because of the grips. Well, imagine having a grip in no gi. This is it. You know, this is the grip. This is the grip that'll change your game. Awesome. All right, Wagner. Thanks for uh, the interview and thanks for everything. And uh, like you said, February twenty third, fifty fifty of the arms dot com. It's gonna be here. And uh, if you have any questions, where could they find you? On Facebook, Twitter, do you have? I have Facebook, uh, Wagner Rocha. Um, also Twitter. I also have Wagner Rocha uh, Martial Arts, which is my gym. So um, and you can look me up Twitter, Instagram, Wagner Rocha Martial Arts on Instagram. So.
bunch awesome. of bunch of places to find me there. All right, guys, February twenty third. All right, take care, man. Thank you.